3. The Golden Rule, Obadiah 10-16 For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off for ever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape, neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. End quote. In verses 10 to 14, we have a vivid account of Edom's participation in the humiliating and bitter defeat of Judah and Jerusalem. It is clearly cited as past, but very recent history. The fresh delight of Edom in crushing Judah whom they had earlier served under David, 2 Samuel 8.14 is very clear, as is the panic and defeat of Judah. Lich renders a part of verse 13 thus, quote, Do not also you gloat over his affliction on the day of his disaster, end quote. And the RSV, quote, You should not have gloated over his disaster in the day of this calamity, end quote. This delight in doing violence to their brother people clearly marked Edom. Obadiah wrote as an eyewitness, verses 10 to 14. Calvin gave the reason why God cited this history of Edom's cruelty to Judah. Quote, we now understand the prophet's meaning, that the Edomians could not complain that God was too severe with them when he reduces them to nothing, because they had given examples of extreme cruelty towards their own brethren and at a time when their calamities ought to have obliterated all hatred and all enmities, as it is usually the case even with men most alienated from one another. End quote. The hostility of Edom stemmed from Israel's election as God's covenant man, Genesis 27.41. This same hostility had been manifested in the time of Moses, Numbers 20. Israel, however, was required by its law to maintain a brotherly attitude towards Edom, Deuteronomy 2, 4 and 5. An abhorrence of an Edomite was forbidden, Deuteronomy 23, 7. At every opportunity Edom sought to do evil, however, to the people of God. In Ezekiel 35, a chapter of judgments against Edom, we are told in verse 5 of Edom's, quote, perpetual hatred, end quote, for God's elect nation and people, and its shedding of blood, quote, by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end, end quote. The law of God requires members of a family to stand with God's law and witness even against their son, if he be evil. But although required to be witnesses, they could not be executioners, as witnesses normally were, their relationship being a bar to it. Deuteronomy 21, 18-21 Edom's sin was envy, Ezekiel 35.11. This envy led its to blasphemies against God's kingdom, Ezekiel 35.12. Because they rejoiced at the calamity and desolation of God's people, God would bring total desolation and calamity upon them, Ezekiel 33.15. Judgment upon Edom, in Obadiah's language, is also pronounced by Jeremiah 49.7-22. The sins of Edom denounced in these verses by Obadiah are 1. The denial of kinship ties, verse 10. 2. Violence, verse 10. 3. Plundering, verses 11 and 13. 4. Pleasure and delight in destruction, verse 12. 5. The slaughter and enslavement of refugees, verse 14. 
The psalmist gives us a vivid account of this savage hatred of Edom for Judah in Psalm 1377. Eleven times in verses 11 to 15, reference is made to the day, the day of thy brother, the day of their calamity, etc. As Robinson noted, quote, The expression day is often thus used to denote occurrence of either good or bad fortune in connection with some place or person. Weird. Jerusalem was to have another day, Luke 19.42, the time of her visitation, but she knew it not. The day of the Lord, on the other hand, which the next section of Obadiah introduces, is the day of Jehovah's final and uninhibited vindication of his own righteousness. End quote. The point is well taken, although the use of the term, quote, good or bad fortune, end quote, is singularly inappropriate. The day has reference to God's sovereign and absolute justice. The day of Jerusalem, or of Judah, is their day in God's court, when both judgment is pronounced and the sentence executed. The day has reference to law, not fortune. The sovereign and absolute lawgiver appoints a day for every man, and for nations and institutions, as well as a final and total day of law and judgment in terms of law. Failure to discuss the day in terms of law leads to a serious misunderstanding of the basis of God's judgment on the day. Edom had taken vengeance wrongfully on its chosen day, Joel 3.19, Amos 1.11, but God appoints his own day. His judgment on the day of Jerusalem gives no man or nation the right to make it an occasion of personal vengeance. It was absolutely necessary for God to avenge himself on Edom, for Edom had taken the law into its own hands for perverse reasons, and the day of God's justice had been turned into a day of injustice. A doctrine of strict retribution is declared. Verse 10. The inscription Dante placed over hell's gates is a sound one. Justice impelled my mighty architect, the power divine and primal love and wisdom, surpassing all, have here constructed me. The heart of this doctrine of retribution is in the golden rule, which appears clearly in Obadiah's prophecy, verses 15 and 16. The golden rule is generally understood only in its positive formulation, in the Sermon on the Mount. Quote, Therefore, All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7 12. It is read to mean a standard of behaviour in which men act kindly to others in the hopes that men will so act towards them. The context of the Golden Rule in Matthew 7 gives every indication that more than kindly action is advised. Quote, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that asketh findeth. Unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. We are told that Quote, this is the law and the prophets, end quote, that is, that is what the law teaches and the prophets confirm and expound. We thus have law, not mere advice. It is more than merely promiscuous love, because we are forbidden to give holy things to dogs or to cast pearls before swine. In other words, we do not believe the same towards all men with no regard for the reality of their religious and moral condition. But more than this, the law refers The golden rule refers not primarily to human relations, but our relationship to God, of which human relationships are a facet. Verse 11 makes clear that God is in view. Verse 12 draws a conclusion from this fact. We are to ask, 
seek and knock in the confidence of a response, because the world is, first, a world of law, and it does not frustrate us, and second, it is moreover the personal world of law of the sovereign God and Father who does not frustrate his children. Therefore, part of that asking and seeking is to obey God's law with respect to our world, to do unto others as we, being God's covenant people, want them to do unto us. This means living in terms of God's law and in his grace. The key to the golden rule is not that it provides man a way to live peaceably in a humanistic sense, but that it declares that God's way is the only way of peace for man. Quote, the golden rule, end quote, is thus a rule, a law, quote, this is the law, end quote. The inverse application and meaning of this law is precisely that which Obadiah formulates, quote, As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee, thy reward shall return upon thine own head, end quote, verse 15. This is God's law. Both positive and negative formulations have legal implications, and both are continually enforced by the lawgiver, whose laws are not left to rest in books, but are the sinews and bones of all life and meaning. The Mosaic law rests on this premise of the golden rule. Jeremiah 50.29 cites the application, quote, Recompense her according to her work, according to all that she hath done, do unto her, for she hath been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel, end quote. In Lamentations 1.22, the appeal is in terms of this law, quote, Let all their wickedness come before thee, and do unto them as thou hast done unto me for all my transgressions, end quote. The golden rule is simply a statement of the positive side of the basic principle of justice, the law of retribution. Quote, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Exodus 21, 23-25 the Golden Rule tells us that this principle of God's law, which must apply to courts of law, is written into the nature of being and also applies to human relationships which are not matters of court justice. As Obadiah uses it in its negative formulation, it refers to God's legal action, his death penalty against the heathen nations, in particular against Edom, quote, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee, end quote. Verse 15. The day of the Lord is always the day of law, that is, a judgment day, and history has many a day of the Lord, culminating in the final judgment. It must be noted, moreover, that every day is the day of the Lord, because every day sees his law in operation, his judgment in motion, and his sentence in execution. Some of God's days are more conspicuous and dramatic in their judgments more final in their executions, but every day sees his justice in sovereign power. We can therefore say always with the psalmist, This is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118.24 Our Lord said, quote, With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Matthew 7.2 a statement which precedes the golden rule and is connected to it by basic meaning, it is a mask of heresy to oppose faith and works. Justification is indeed by faith only, but, quote, faith without works is dead, end quote, James 2.26. After declaring the golden rule, Christ went on to state that, quote, ye shall know them by their fruits, end quote, Matthew 7.16 and made it emphatic that judgment is a lot of all who bear bad fruit. Matthew 7, 16-20 The day of the Lord is a day of retribution, a day of execution for failure to bear good fruit, and also a day of reward. Matthew 25, 34-36 Leach touches on this in this comments, quote, Every visitation, every judgment of the Lord, be that a just penalty for the enemies of his kingdom, or a gracious visitation for the members of his church on earth, is a forerunner of, and a guarantee for, the final day of the Lord. 
These individual harbingers of the last day form, as it were, the rays diverging from the focal point, the last day, towards which they at the same time converge. Therefore, every judgment of God upon the wicked world is in a certain sense, and to a certain extent, a day of the Lord, presaging the great day of the Lord, whether it be the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, or the annihilation of Edom, or the fall of Babylon, or the civil war, or World War I or II. End quote. Moreover, since every judgment is a deliverance in that it executes the lawbreakers, the greater the judgments, the greater the deliverance, and the closer we come to the final judgments, the greater will be the nature of our deliverance. There cannot be a progress of judgment in history without a progress of deliverance, because God's government is not a mere negation, nor the mere execution of his enemies, but the enactments of a conquering and triumphant kingdom. Quote, Edom is a type of all nations which are in hostility to the Lord and his people, and therefore what Obadiah says of Edom applies to all nations which assume the same or a similar attitude towards the people of God. End quote. Therefore, Obadiah pronounces God's sentence, quote, Upon all the heathen, end quote, or all ungodly nations, verse 15, in the person of Edom, they shall, quote, drink, end quote, continuously of God's judgment, that is, in every age, those who, quote, have drunk upon my holy mountain, end quote, shall find that they drink, not in the flesh of victory and their celebration thereof, but to their death. Pusey rightfully cited the ancient custom, often referred to in scripture, of using captured vessels to drink in celebration of victory. Possession of the defeated men's wives and drinking out of their vessels, especially religious vessels, were symbols of victory in the ancient world. Quote, Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. End quote. Quote, swallow down adds the idea of completeness to the previous drink, by this judgment, the pagan nations will be destroyed without a remaining trace. End quote. If this be true, and a generalization by Obadiah of Edom's judgment is to quote, all the nations, end quote, verse 15, RSV, etc., then all the ungodly nations will be destroyed utterly, and God's kingdom shall prevail. No other conclusion is tenable. The golden rule is then a gold rule indeed. It means that God refines the dross out of the world and burns it up in order to establish his true realm of gold, the kingdom of God. The age of gold is thus the age of law.